Quick reminder, all of my videos have minimal ads, and as always, only three mid-roll ads in this video. One after story number one, one after story number two, and one more after story number three. I place them towards the beginning of each video so that you can enjoy the rest of the video ad-free. I hope you enjoy. Please do me a huge favor and like the video if you do enjoy it, and subscribe to my channel so you never miss future videos. Now, let's begin. I'm an EMT, have been for almost three years now. I live and work in Southern California, and this particular transport happened when I was a brand new EMS worker at four months at a private ambulance company. This company was a private BLS, or basic life support company primarily, meaning we typically transported patients whose care provider had a contract with us. However, Sometimes we would run 911 calls out of prisons. This is where my story begins. It was late into the night at our station when I heard the tone from my radio. Unit 221 priority response to state prison for an unknown medical. Copy, wheels up in two, I replied. I walked over to my partner who was sleeping on our rec area couch. Rise, a life needs saving. I sarcastically exclaimed. We hopped into the rig, the engine roared to life, and we set off, lights blazing, sirens wailing. As we approached the prison, we killed the lights and sirens and proceeded with the routine security check. Once the guards were satisfied with the search, we were given access and led through the gates and parked outside the medical bay. Gurney and medical equipment in tow, we entered the prison hospital. Now, because my partner was the patient person for the last call, I was going to be primary care provider for this patient. Though I had been a pretty new EMT, I had done a lot of prison transports in a small period of time. I have had inmates scream at me, try to bribe me, and yes, even try to hurt me. So as you can imagine, I really wasn't looking for fight night on Unit 221 at 4 in the morning. Regardless, I always prepared for the worst. We were escorted in by guards as usual and led into the main area of the hospital's rooms, which were still fitted as cells. I was approached by a nurse who gave me a sheet of paper with his information and most recent vitals. I began to ask for the turnover report and why this patient required transport and where we were transporting to. The nurse stared blankly for a moment before he said, You're going to Scripps Mercy Shores Hospital, room 329. He's going because he doesn't feel well and he needs some tests done. He shouldn't be a problem for you. Already a few silent alarms were going off in my head. Scripps Mercy Shores is a rich people hospital. I have never heard of anyone other than someone wealthy going there, let alone a prisoner. Second, not feeling well and needs tests don't really paint me a great picture for why he needs to go and what I'll be dealing with. And finally, what does he shouldn't be a problem for you mean? If he's a violent inmate or even an at-risk patient, they would normally just say so. Getting an actual report on this patient's health and medical condition was like getting blood from a stone. I decided to just relent and go ahead with the transport. The prison guards brought the shackled patient out to us. Another oddity. Every other time I would go in and talk with them before getting them onto the gurney. Standing before me was a tall, rather frail looking man with dark complexion. His eyes were red and sunken. His overall demeanor was a fearful one. He was constantly shivering. He looked horrible. I introduced myself and began my whole checklist of things to ask and address. We'll call him David. He answered all my questions with a small and quivering voice. When I asked what the problem was tonight, he gave a quick and frightened glance towards the guards and the nurse. I don't feel well. His reply sounded forced and rehearsed. Abuse from the staff came to mind first 
but I would address that later. I decided to just go ahead and get this guy going, and I would wrap everything up in the ambulance. Before loading him in, I asked him the same question I asked all inmate patients. Be straight with me and I'll be straight with you. Are you going to cause problems once we get going? He quickly shook his head no, and we were off. When transporting prisoners, one guard accompanies in the ambulance, and another follows in what's called a tail car. This is for everyone's safety, and ensuring that if the patient tries anything, an official guard is there to address it. I was busy writing up my report when I realized that between the confusion of the call and the late hour, I had forgotten to get my own set of vitals. A rookie mistake. We were about halfway to our destination, and the patient had remained silent this whole time. I told him I was going to take his vitals and instructed him to give me his arm so I could begin. He did so immediately, like he was trained to obey anything demanded of him, and did so with that haunting look of fear. I wrapped my blood pressure cuff around his arm, and that's when I felt him for the first time. His skin was ice cold. There wasn't even a slight warmth to his skin. I asked him if he would like a blanket, but he declined. I continued with my evaluation. I inflated the cuff, pressed my stethoscope to his brachial artery, and listened for the pulse to come back to show me his blood pressure. It did not come back. At first I thought my stethoscope was broken, so I grabbed a spare one. Same result. No pulse. I removed all my equipment and felt for his pulse myself. Nothing. I looked at him and asked if he felt alright. He replied with a simple, quiet, I'm okay. Thank you. Caught off guard, I grabbed my pulse oximetry, which is used to find a heart rate and blood oxygen level, and put it on his finger. After a moment of the machine reading, the heart rate came back at zero, and the blood oxygen level came back at zero. My heart dropped. I took another set of vitals to see if I misread anything, but they all came back the same. Heart rate, zero. Blood pressure, zero. Blood oxygen level, zero. The only thing consistent was his respiratory rate, which was 24 breaths a minute. A bit higher than resting rate, but not alarming in itself. I looked back again and asked him once more if he's okay. He looked me in the eyes and nodded his head, yes, as tears welled up in his eyes. Then he looked away. He was completely alert. He responded perfectly to all my questions. His eyes were equal and reactive, all signs of good brain function, but no signs of a pulse or any vascular activity. At this point, I don't know what to think. Scientifically, there is no reason this guy should be alive. Even if he had an artificial heart, he would be showing vital signs and have a battery pack with a filter kit. But he is right in front of me, alert, breathing, talking when addressed. It makes absolutely no sense. I decided to continue investigating. I listened to his heart with my stethoscope. There was no beating, no thumping just the muffled sounds of his breathing. While I was there, I listened to his lungs. All clear. All normal. I had just finished listening to his chest when we pulled into our destination. We offloaded him from the ambulance, took him to the room we were instructed to. Then he hopped off the gurney and was escorted to the hospital bed by the guards. I began giving my almost unbelievable turnover report to the nurse who surprisingly did not seem alarmed by any of it. I wrapped up my turnover and then sat down in a nearby chair to finish up my report. As I sat, typing away at my computer, I am interrupted by the sound of a hospital gurney rolling down the hallway. It was accompanied by four people in surgical gowns who entered the inmate's room with said gurney. After a few minutes, the team in surgical attire emerges from the room inmate strapped down to the gurney, with restraints. He is audibly crying, and they wheel him down the hall and around the corner. That was the last I saw of him.
I told my partner once we were back in the ambulance. He didn't believe me at first, which I can understand. I joke around a lot, but with the look I gave him, he knew I wasn't kidding. This story may not have been what you were expecting. It's not violent or particularly frightening, but this was hands down the most disturbing call I have ever had. I don't know what I saw. I don't know what I transported. I have my theories, such as experimental treatments being carried out on inmates, but with skin like ice, hardly any vital signs, and such a fearful demeanor, I can only wonder what kind of experiments and what kind of horrors this man had faced. This story is 100% real. Here is a little bit about me. I live with my mom, dad, younger brother, and our dog in a very rural area in Germany. When this happened, I was about 13 years old. We don't have any close neighbors. It was a very cold Saturday in December. I remember the day because my mother only worked on Saturdays. My brother, father, and I spent our afternoon watching movies. It was close to 5 p.m. at the point this happened. Since it was winter, it was nearly dark outside. The room was lit by the TV and our fireplace. At one point, my brother looked outside the window because it started to snow heavily. We all looked outside the window when all of a sudden, my dog began to growl. He ran up and down the room, very alert. This was very unusual for him to do. My dad stood up and looked around, but he didn't see anything. After a few minutes, he began to calm down again. We returned to our movie, and everything was fine for a few minutes. Then, he started doing it again. I noticed my brother was staring out the window next to our back door. I asked him what he saw, and he shook his head. Then, all of a sudden, we saw an elderly lady approaching our back door. We were baffled because hardly anyone comes out here, especially not an older lady like this. She looked to be around 80 or 90, wearing one of those typical grandma aprons and a headscarf. Mind you, it was below zero outside. She tapped on the back door glass and started to smile really weird. Meanwhile, my dog hid under the table whimpering and growling. My brother came close to me and my dad walked to the back door and opened it a bit. In a confused tone, he asked what she was doing in our backyard. She smiled and looked directly past him at us. She never even looked at my dad. She took a step forward to the door, shoving her foot inside. My dad immediately pushed her foot back and shut the door on her. She glared at him, and then at us, before she started to laugh maniacally. Then, she just calmly walked away, like nothing had happened. We looked at each other in confusion, not knowing what to say. My brother and I looked outside the window behind us. We couldn't see her. The only way in and out of our backyard was the small path next to the house. From the window behind us, we would have seen her leaving but she never passed by the window. My dad stepped outside and couldn't see her anywhere. Neither could he see any footprints in the snow. There was absolutely no way the tracks would have been covered by snow already, since only a couple of minutes had passed between her leaving and my dad going outside. To this day, we don't know what happened that day. I don't know if this was something paranormal or not. It may not seem so creepy to you, but to us as kids, this was the most terrifying thing we have ever witnessed. This happened in college, maybe seven years ago. At the time, I was living with one of my best friends and we were very into the bar scene and partying and such. We lived in a city that was very much inundated with college kids, so it was never hard to find a party. And I am ashamed to admit it, but probably every other night, 
I was out partying. So this story starts on a night very much like every other. She and I got all dressed up and went on a bar crawl. We ended up at this club. It was one of the more popular ones in the area, and we meet up with my ex-roommate. The three of us are having a great night, but periodically, we were all interacting with this one guy. None of us remember his name, but he seemed normal enough. He sat next to us on the smoking porch and bummed a cig from me. He bought my friend a drink, and he was dancing next to us. We even all had a little conversation together, although I can't for the life of me remember what it was about. But he was there, in the periphery, all night. Around 1am, the three of us decided that we were drunk enough and done dancing, and my ex-roommate invites me and the bestie to her place to smoke. None of us have cars at this point, but it's a nice night, and she only lives a couple of miles away, so we start walking. The downtown streets quickly turn into a semi-residential, semi-warehouse district area. Not the best part of town, or the most populated, but not a bad area by any means, and usually the streets are fully empty. We are maybe halfway to the house when we notice there's someone behind us trailing along and getting closer. We really don't think anything of it until we pause to light up some cigarettes, and he catches up, and we realize it's the guy who had been hanging around us at the bar. He's kind of stumbly, clearly drunk, and he greets us like old friends. We don't want to be rude, but it strikes all of us as kind of weird that he's there to begin with, but we shrug it off because he's drunk and seemingly harmless. I should say right now, he's a real scrawny guy, on the taller side, but thin, very thin, with a baby face and very big eyes. He just looks generally harmless and drunk. He asks if he can bum a smoke and walk with us until he gets where he's going, which isn't far, and he's clearly very unsteady on his feet, so we say sure, why not. So we're walking and chatting, and we're getting closer to our destination, but he doesn't make any indication of where he's going. So finally, I ask him, where do you live anyway? And he gives me this funny look, like I had asked something really stupid, and says, oh, I don't live anywhere near here. This kind of creeps us all out, and we sort of stop where we are, and I say, okay, well then where are you going? And he replies, oh, I'm following you. At this point, I think that maybe there's been like a misunderstanding in his mind, so I respond with something along the lines of, Okay, well no offense, but we don't even know your name, so you're not coming with us. And he gets this look, like hurt, but also angry, and a little manic, and he gets kind of loud and says, But I told you all my name. I told each of you my name. How do none of you remember my name? At this point, my ex-roommate steps in and says, Look, man, I know you're drunk, but you really need to calm down. And the guy stops and gets real calm, real fast. And he gets this really serious look and says, No, I'm not drunk. I'm fine. I just knew you'd trust me more if you thought I was drunk. At that point, I'm like, Uh, no, I'm out. But my roommate doesn't believe him and says something like, You've been stumbling this whole time, of course you're drunk. And he shakes his head, and in a completely calm tone, with no slurring whatsoever, he goes, No, I'm sober. I just wanted to see if you'd let me in your house. And my friend responds, Why? And the guy gets this huge smile, and his big eyes get even wider, and he says, I just wanted to see how close I could get to killing you. At that point, I had had enough, and I put on my authority voice, and I told him that that is enough and that we're leaving, and he needs to go the other direction now before I call the cops. He just shrugs and says, Fine. And we scurry away and leave him leaning up against a stop sign, just smoking a cig and watching us go. As soon as we are around the corner, we all break into a dead sprint and run for a few blocks, and then stop and freak out. We are in the middle of a panic whisper huddle when my friend looks over my shoulder and lets out this little scream. We turn around, and there he is. It's dark, so we can't really see his face, 
just his silhouette against the street lamps, but it was enough to know it was definitely him. He is striding down the road a few blocks down, hands in his pockets, not a trace of a stumble, and he's not exactly running, but he's walking at this real brisk pace, and he had been on us in less than a minute. Luckily, we're only about a block away from my friend's place, so we start booking it there. We're almost at the front door when I realize, oh crap, we don't want him to know where we're going. Not the three of us alone. That seems dangerous. Fortune shines on us. As up the block, I can see the telltale signs of a garage party, and we book it over there instead. We come up to the lawn, and there's a bunch of guys out front, and we are breathlessly trying to explain ourselves, but when we turn around to point out the guy, he's gone. The partiers sympathize and let us hang out for a few hours, and a few of them even walked us back to the house. Thankfully, we never saw the guy again. And needless to say, my friends and I lost our taste for partying for quite a while after that. I don't know what compelled me to finally share this, but I have been thinking about it a lot the past few days. I have a lot of thoughts about this, as it was the first and only time I felt legitimately afraid for my life. When I was about eight years old, my parents were going through a divorce, and me and my older sister used to spend a lot of time at our grandparents' house. It's a long, ranch-style home on a corner in a very nice neighborhood that's a 10-minute walk from a gas station, grocery store, and a few fast food restaurants. The streets are long and lined with well-manicured houses, cradled by big, scenic California Valley hills all around. We were never very wealthy, but my grandpa bought it as a fixer-upper many years ago, and the property value has skyrocketed since then. As you can imagine, it's a very safe spot, and although there weren't many other kids in the neighborhood, it wasn't uncommon to see neighbors walking their dogs or pushing a stroller down the sidewalk outside of our house. Although my mom was especially protective all our lives, this particular neighborhood was densely populated and my family knew just about everyone who lived there. She grew up in that neighborhood herself, so she was understandably trusting. She would once in a while let me and my sister walk to the Rotten Robbie gas station on the other end of the block to grab a snack. I would always get a ring pop, and my sister would grab a Three Musketeers before we made our way back home. My sister was about 11 at the time, and this small amount of freedom was a really big deal to us. Nothing compared to walking down that street all by ourselves in the summertime, laughing and joking around, a couple dollar bills in our pockets. I felt like I owned the world. The one oddity I ever noticed around the neighborhood was a small camper that was parked on the side of the road opposite to the gas station, right along the backside of the fence of another house. It sat there in the shade like a permanent fixture, all the windows constantly covered by opaque beige curtains. I can't explain why, but it always gave me this deep sense of foreboding when I would pass it. I was almost positive someone was living inside it because at times, I would hear the air conditioning running as it sat stagnant in the same spot. The hairs on my neck would always stand on end as I passed it, particularly as I passed the camper door, and I'd always keep an eye on it for the fear that one day it would swing open just as I came to pass by. I think what bothered me the most was a drawing taped to the door from the inside. It was extremely messy, a sketch of odd lines in a brown colored pencil that was frustratingly indiscernible. I could see the outline of something, a vague shape, but could never make out what it was intended to be. I never had the nerves to stop and stare long enough to really investigate, but each time I walked by, I would steal a glance. A year prior to the incident I'm about to describe, I was walking with my mom past the camper in the shade. We had just gone to the park nearby and, unfortunately, had to pass the camper before we could cross the street and continue walking. I didn't want to seem afraid, so I kept on walking right behind her and did not object when she walked past it. This time, I felt a little more brave. 
I was frustrated not being able to decipher the drawing for so long and while my mom was feet away, I stopped in front of the camper door and took a moment to really look at the drawing. Upon closer inspection, the paper was filthy. I remember doing a project in elementary school where we soaked printer paper in black coffee to make it look aged, and that's what it reminded me of. My mom walked on without noticing that I had stopped following her, but my eyes stayed fixed on the indistinct mass of dirt-caked scribbles until I could make out what looked to be a tiny, malformed face. My stomach turned. I immediately felt cold and disgusted as my eyes trailed over the rest of the image. I didn't know what kind of creature it was at the time, but now I can look back and say the drawing was a badly deformed fetus inside a mass of large, perfect circles, like those made by a circular ring ruler. Its face was contorted, as if in pain. It was so graphically disturbing, and seemed to portray this odd sense of suffering that stuck with me for days. As a child, I didn't know how to process it, and the mental image still makes me sick to think about. I had never seen anything like it before. Adrenaline flooded my body, and my chest hurt with fear, but I selfishly thought of my glorious little trips for ring pops and said absolutely nothing as I followed behind my mom. This was, in retrospect, a classically terrible idea. It's one of those things you scream at main characters in movies for. Ever since my ill feelings towards the camper had been elevated by the drawing on the door, I thought about it every time we drove by, and about a month later, my mom once again graced us with several bucks and permission to walk down to Rotten Robbie and grab our respective snacks. I thought about telling my sister about what I had seen on the way there, but she was older and braver, and I was terrified she would make me cross the street with her to check it out. It was a bright sunny day, and I told myself with false certainty that nothing was going to happen. If I didn't acknowledge it, maybe it would go away. We walked past the camper, and it was thankfully uneventful. On the walk back, I was feeling more comfortable and was focused on fighting open my candy wrapper until my sister walked alongside me. We passed the camper a second time, but I didn't give it half as much thought as the first time. I don't remember what we were talking about, but I recall being interrupted mid-sentence as my sister softly, yet firmly, said my name. There was a distinct fear in her voice that immediately set me on edge, like a bucket of ice water. All my senses heightened, and I became aware of everything, including the sound of haphazard footsteps about ten feet behind us. It was accompanied by a heavy rustling sound, like a heavy backpack, and nervously, I half turned my head to look. A man with a long, unkempt beard and wearing many layers of ragged clothing stood behind us, eyes unmistakably burning into our backs as he walked. His movements weren't normal. It was a drunken shuffle, like each of his feet were unimaginably heavy and needed to be moved one grand effort at a time. His shoulders were skewed, head tilted downward with a strange arc of his neck. I could hear his shoes scraping the gravel with every step, but rather than seeming genuinely intoxicated, it was as if he was intentionally meandering our direction like a zombie with the direct effort to frighten us. Behind him, I saw that the camper door was wide open for the first time in all the years we had spent living there, and realized this was the man who had been living inside. He's following us. I choked out, my eyes filling with tears. My mind was spinning as I stared straight ahead again, and the wide street and sidewalks abnormally empty all around. My sister grabbed my hand. She squeezed it hard enough to hurt, without looking my way, speaking carefully under her breath. On the count of three, we race home, she told me, in a very serious tone of voice. I couldn't reply through the growing lump in my throat, but every single cell in my body understood that we had to put some distance between us and this man as quickly as possible. She began to count steadily while we walked faster, and the most terrifying part is that he started running before we even had a chance to. 
He must have heard her directions to me and tried to get a head start by sprinting our direction before she got to three. But his footsteps were noisy and we bolted like deer the instant we heard him behind us. I'll never forget it. The chase felt exactly like you imagine in your nightmares. The fear your pursuer is inches away from grabbing your arm or a fistful of your hair. I pictured myself being dragged into the van with nobody around to see or hear me. We ran so fast, we didn't even have the breath to scream, and peering back behind me, about ten seconds later, I saw him running in our direction with absolutely none of the impairment he showed with those zombie-like steps moments before. I think back on it now, and he may have been deliberately pretending to be handicapped to lower our guard so we wouldn't start running. The thought is terrifying, but I can't rationalize it any other way. We made it to our grandparents' house and, without looking behind us, yanked open the stubborn old door before slamming it closed and scrambling past their excited dogs to get as deep into the house as possible. I don't even think we locked it, as our main goal was getting within the line of sight of any adults as quickly as possible. My mom was talking to my grandpa at the table and gave us an amused look when we bounded into the living room. Since we were kids, running around wasn't anything out of the ordinary, and she didn't ask what happened as we collapsed on the couch and tried to catch our breath. The inside of the house felt safe and felt in such good spirits that I didn't even want to bring up what just happened. Like waking up from a nightmare you don't want to talk about, I was desperate to go back to normalcy. I wanted to forget it entirely, to unwrap my candy and act like everything was completely normal for the sake of my own sanity, and that's exactly what I did. I asked my sister a few years back if she remembered this incident, and her response was strange. She remembered immediately without the need for me to provide details, but she quickly waved it off and insisted he had to have been a bored homeless man looking to spook some kids walking home with no real intent to harm anyone. I don't know. I'd like to believe it's some innocent misunderstanding, but like they always say about gut feelings, they are rarely wrong. I feel in my soul that he wanted to hurt me and my sister that day. I never told her or anyone else about the strange drawing on the door, and I'm not sure if my sister saw the open door and connected him to the camper or not. It's one of my biggest regrets, as I would hate for any other children to have been less fortunate after innocently walking past the camper in the shade. I believe he may have chosen the spot between the park and gas station deliberately due to the number of children walking around the area. I never saw the camper again a day or so after this. I am not proud of how I handled this and would encourage anyone who finds themselves in a similar situation to contact authorities immediately for the safety of others around. I don't know if maybe this whole story comes off as melodramatic, but it was very real and very frightening in a way that I cannot forget. I work at a nonprofit home that works with people experiencing mental health or substance use barriers. We have an in-home location for services and also offer a warm line for individuals to call. In my line of work, you experience beautiful life-changing moments, heart-wrenching traumas, overdoses, recovery stories, and everything in between. Needless to say, myself and many others in my field can attest that very little tends to surprise you. However, this story was one of those that completely took me off guard. A few years back, we had a gentleman with a very unique voice that would call almost every day with a private number. The subject matter of his calls seemed harmless at first, but slowly seemed to escalate. He started by talking about worries that he had at home, but as his call frequency increased, so did his tendency to overshare. He began telling our female team members completely inappropriate things. He eventually told us that he enjoyed super gluing women to chairs to watch them struggle to get out of this seat. The first time I heard this, my face became simultaneously cold and hot. 
I could not believe what I had heard. I was in an angry state of shock and said that I had to end the call due to the apparent lack of words that had stricken me. Weeks went on and we had heard very little from our secretive super glue aficionado until it was a quiet day at the office and our mid-shift person had called in. Usually, we would try to find someone to replace this shift, but since we had no guests currently, we decided it best that I just hold the fort down on my own. I would soon find out what a mistake that was. I tried to keep myself busy, and while I was doing some paperwork and cleaning around the office space, I heard a knock at the front door. At this point, I was not expecting anyone, and potential guests are expected to call before coming to stay, or to see the location, as to best protect everyone's safety and confidentiality. I approached the frosted glass pane in the center of the door, and saw a large shape of a man eclipsing our equally large doorway. I cracked the door open, and sternly greeted the man and asked, What can I do for you? He stared at me in a way that wasn't completely predatory, but also did not feel safe. He remained silent for a few seconds before a very eerily familiar voice said, I need to talk. He pushed the door fully open and let himself in as I stared in a state of disbelief. He continued on from his earlier statement and chuckled out, So let's talk. As calmly as I could, I offered him a seat at the table in the dining room area and sat across from him. His eyes stayed locked on mine, and if I was not almost completely positive that this was our mystery caller, what he said next fully confirmed it. While remaining his cold eye contact, he said in a seemingly amused way, I have this problem. I don't know if it's a problem really, but I can't stop doing it and I don't really know what to do. You see, I like to glue women to chairs. I like knowing that I'm causing them discomfort and that they are stuck because of me. I like watching them struggle, and it makes me feel better than anything else I've ever done. The feeling is completely... euphoric. It was taking everything in me to not cry on the spot. This was causing every alarm signal in my body to scream at me to get out or get harmed. I slowly slid my hand towards the work phone while looking at every possible exit and finding a flaw in every potential escape route and hoping that he would not notice. As my pinky edged the case of the phone, I saw his dark eyes flick over to where my hand was. Am I making you uncomfortable? I assure you I'm not going to harm you. I just want to talk. Just talk. He teasingly said as I stammered out a falsely confident, I'm not uncomfortable. My boss will be here soon, so I was just trying to see if she had messaged the work phone. He continued staring ice-cold daggers into my eyes that caused me to sit up straighter in an attempt to mask the involuntary shiver that had taken over my body. Is that so? Well, I wouldn't want to keep you occupied any longer. As he stood up, my heart began to pound impossibly more. I had no idea if he was going to harm me, leave or both. He began walking towards me, and as he towered over me, my heart was practically fully in my throat. At that point, he extended a hand out and said, Thanks for the chat. I quietly grabbed the tips of his fingers and choked out a, You're welcome. He smirked at me as he began walking to the door. As soon as he shut the door behind him, I locked the deadbolt and called my director. After the incident, I installed a panic button app on the phone and put chain locks on each entrance to allow us to open the door when needing, but to hopefully help us avoid people pushing the door fully open and finding ourselves uncomfortable and in potentially dangerous situations in the future. A week went by, and I was at the office with a fairly new mid-shift team member, and she received a call from a private number. I watched as her face dropped after answering the call. I took the phone from her and introduced myself. I heard that same, nauseatingly familiar voice say, Hello, I just want to talk. I can't stop asking women their bra sizes in public. I was done. I barked out. Sir, this is not that kind of warm line. 
The Addict Anonymous meetings are every Thursday, and I can give you their number. But the reason that we are here is because we have our own lived experience and traumas that do not need to be reactivated. Thank you for calling and have a good day. Months went by without seeing or hearing that voice until I was waiting for some takeout in the waiting area of a restaurant and once again heard that spine-chilling voice enter my ears. I looked up and met those same dark eyes that caused me and my team so much panic and distress just months prior. They were there in front of me yet again. He looked panicked and taken by surprise in contrast to his amused and cocky persona that he portrayed before. He swept up the food in a hurried rush and found his way to his vehicle and tried to speed off, but not before I managed to photograph his vehicle make and model. So if he ever decided to make an impromptu visit again or drive by, we would have the information. I love my job, and I cannot stress enough that the taboo around mental health needs to be lessened. It's very unfortunate that someone was not even properly utilizing our services and they had made such a lasting impression of myself and my other team members. I still become incredibly anxious every time I hear the doorbell ring or a knock at the door when I am alone at work. Be kind to those that are unwell and need compassion, but always be mindful of your own well-being and listen to your gut feelings, because some people with or without diagnosis or labels can be dangerous. Be safe out there. After my freshman year of high school, I moved states. With my parents being split up, I moved with my mom, so once a month I would fly down to where I used to live and visit my dad. I would fly alone, seeing as I am 16. When I got to the airport, I went to my terminal, waiting to get onto my flight. I looked up from where I was sitting to see a man staring at me. He wasn't shaggy or rough looking. He looked like a middle class older man. The man looked to be in his mid-forties. I didn't really think anything of it because usually I space out the airport. When they called my number to board the plane, I looked back to see the man staring at me again, and this time he grinned at me. I was very uncomfortable at this point, but since there was free seating on this airline, I figured I would just sit in the very back, hoping he wouldn't follow me. When I got to my seat, I looked out for the man, hoping he would take one of the front seats because they were all open. Instead, I see him make his way to the back, and he sits right next to me. I was near the window, and the middle and aisle seat were both open. And you guessed it, he sat in the middle seat. At this point, I was really freaking out, because I did not get good vibes off this guy at all. He smiled at me, and I gave him a weak smile, and turned my head to the window, hoping he would not talk. Hey. My name is Jack. What's yours? I looked at him and panicked. Riley? I said. I gave him my real name. As it left my lips, it ventured into his. Riley. What a beautiful name. I just said thanks and continued to look out the window. What school do you go to, Riley? The way that he said my name made me scream on the inside. I wanted him far away from me. I said back, I don't see how that's important. He looked at me and put his hands up and apologized, chuckling. He then started talking to me about his job. He was a college football ref and asked me if I was a cheerleader, which I was wearing my cheerleading jacket, so I assumed he already knew. I just nodded, not wanting to engage in conversation anymore. Thankfully, this man came and sat in the aisle seat, and Jack stopped talking to me, however, constantly staring at me. I faced my head opposite to his and put my head down, pretending to be asleep. I did eventually fall asleep, and I was awakened to the plane landing. Relief spread throughout my entire body. You're such a cute sleeper. I wish you would have never woken up he says with the most sinister grin. My eyes widened and my blood ran cold. I didn't say anything and just unbuckled my seat, giving him the impression I was trying to get off. 
When the aisle started to disperse out of the plane, he walked off and paused, looking back at me. I let four people pass me before stepping onto the aisle, and I saw rage in his eyes. He continued walking down the aisle with his head down. When I got to the front of the plane, I went to say thank you to the flight attendants and pilot like I always do. However, the flight attendant pulled me aside. She said, Hey, do you know that man that was sitting next to you? I shook my head, no. Her face went white. When you fell asleep, he was taking pictures of you and telling us how cute his daughter was when she was sleeping. I was very puzzled because your body language was off. I asked her to walk me down to baggage claim, and she agreed, since she had time to kill. When we walked out of the plane and into the airport, Jack was standing there, waiting for me. She told me to keep walking, and I did. I ran into my dad's arms when I finally saw him. The man saw this and went the opposite direction. I don't know what his intentions were, but I am glad I never found out. I also realized that my school's initials were on my jacket, which makes me very nervous. This happened a long time ago when I was about four or five years old, and I'm 15 now. Looking back at the situation, I really think I should have seen the red flags about this guy, but since I was really young and stupid, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I thought he was just a nice guy. The whole thing happened in a mall, in plain sight, in front of hundreds of people. I had gone with my mother shopping, a girl's day out kind of thing. At some point, I got lost. Typical, everyone has a story like that, right? So far, no red flags at all. I remember seeing a guy with a very southeastern accent. He was dressed like a junkie, but in my five-year-old mind, I thought he looked fine. So, since I was a lost five-year-old girl who didn't know any better, I walked up to him and asked him for directions, and if he had seen my mommy, etc., he ignored my questions and when he saw me, his eyes lit up. He immediately started showering me with compliments, some of them inappropriate to say to a five-year-old kid. He gave me a pink and black bracelet and told me how well it looked on me. Of course, I was oblivious to the situation and ignoring all the red flags. So, at some point, he offers to take me to his private jet and fly me to Jamaica to relax and play with the dolphins, basically made it sound like a child's paradise. All I had to do was get in his car. Of course, since it sounded like a dream come true, I trusted him. I kid you not, at the exact moment I was about to leave the mall, some guy wearing a suit and tie stopped us dead in our tracks and asked him where he was going with a five-year-old girl. You could easily tell that we weren't related. The guy responded with his raspy southeastern accent and said that I was his daughter's kid and he was taking me home. We were clearly not related, and so the guy in the suit asked me where my mom was. I told him she was still in the mall, and from that point on, there was some arguing between the two men. I didn't get the most of it, but I ended up going with the man in the suit, and the junkie cursed him out. We went to the lobby of the mall and found my mom there, telling the worker behind the desk my description. She had clearly picked up by this point that I was gone. It turned out that the guy in the suit was a security guard at the mall, and had picked up on how wrong the situation was. When my mom saw me with this guy, she picked me up and hugged me. This story is in fact very old, but I recently was reminded of it because a couple of my friends told me they were planning on going to Jamaica for vacation and the memories just came flooding back. So, security guard, who noticed how wrong the situation was, thank you. Thank you so much. I live in a two-bedroom apartment. The complex has no security guards whatsoever. With one other roommate. We'll call her 
Emily. It's also important to know that a lot of people will ask Emily if we are twins. We look very similar. She and I both spend almost every night at our boyfriend's house, and rarely are home. One night around 8.45 p.m., I was home cleaning before I left to go to my boyfriend's house. I ran to get something from my car and came back into my apartment. Locking the door behind me, five minutes after, I hear a knock at my door. I'm already a paranoid person, so I got a little scared. I knew it wasn't Emily, because she would have called to tell me she forgot her key. I tried to ignore it. Then a second knock. These also weren't innocent knocks. They sounded like a cop knock. Immediately after the second knock, I faced down my boyfriend. He is convincing me to look through the people. I look, and no one else is there. I say, okay. I'm going to pack my stuff and come over. I ran and locked myself in the bathroom, crying until he got there to get me. And no one was at my door. The next day, my boyfriend and I stopped at my apartment. So I could change and get ready for a Cinco de Mayo gathering. Less than eight people to stay social distance. No knocks that day. The day after I got home, Emily was getting kitty litter and was going to meet me at the apartment since we were both too scared to be there alone. I get home and was sitting on my phone scrolling through TikToks. About ten minutes into the scroll, I hear the same knock. I look through the peephole and call Emily and describe to her what the guy looked like. She has no idea who it can be. I then watched him walk away and thought maybe he will stop. Another five minutes pass and he's back knocking. I FaceTime Emily again and she tells me to open the door. Don't ever do this. I opened the door and the guy was a bit muscular. Looked a little bit older than me. I'm 23. And was someone who I'd never seen around my apartment complex before. He seemed shocked that I answered. The conversation. Him. Oh, is this a bad time? Yes. I was just wondering. Do you have a printer? No. Oh, okay. He slowly walks away. I also thought it was weird that someone was asking for a printer. Being that all classes were moved to online format, and we're supposed to be in quarantine. And also, if you need a printer that bad, and someone doesn't answer the first knock, why would you keep trying? especially when you don't know that person. We told a bunch of people about the knocking in our complex, and one other apartment said that they had the same issue. They were also two girls living alone. The next day, Emily went back with her boyfriend. As she was leaving the apartment, she heard from a balcony next to ours, Yo, is that her? She turned around, and the two men ran back inside. We told the apartment complex and called the cops. They said they can't really do anything unless the guy is present at our door knocking. After this, we installed a motion detection camera and put a sign up on our window. We have cameras. You're being recorded. Since then, Emily has moved out. I have two new male roommates who are seen coming in and out of the apartment, and no one has came and knocked. This happened to a friend of mine who lived in the same neighborhood as me. When we were about 8 to 9 years old, my friend, E, and her family lived just a few houses down from the street from mine. We lived in a neighborhood where almost everyone knew each other. The biggest worry we ever had was that an outsider would come to the neighborhood and cause trouble. Some people left their homes unlocked because we felt that safe. There was an incredibly nice family that lived directly across the street from E's house. A mom, a dad, and a 16-year-old son, and their mentally challenged son, who was 22 years old. I'll call him Tim. Tim was always home because he wasn't employed due to his disability, but his parents were working full-time and his brother had school. All day, every day, he would be outside waving and smiling at anyone who drove or walked by. Big smiles, showing all of his teeth and sometimes giggling just out of the pure excitement and happiness of interacting with other people, since he spent most of his time alone. He was not creepy. One day, E was sick and didn't go to school. 
Even though she was only about eight or nine years old, E was allowed to stay home sick by herself. Plus, her mom was going to be home around two anyways, since she was only working part time, and the neighborhood was safe. E locked all the doors except for the one that led into the garage. They used this as their front door because it was easier in those cookie cutter homes to just open the garage, pull in and get out of the car, close the garage and walk into their house through the unlocked door that led from the inside of the garage to the inside of their home. This is obviously not the safest way to protect your home from intruders, but we literally all did it. As if a flimsy garage door could keep anyone from getting into what they wanted. The worst part is that they had an outside cat and kept the garage door cracked just enough for him to get inside for his food or shelter if he needed to. So, he's asleep, feeling sick, and with a fever. All the doors and windows are locked, except for the door that leads to the cracked garage door. Tim was bound to know she was home alone since he was outside the front of his house all the time. He wakes up to the pounding at the front door. Startled, she walks downstairs and looks through the peephole. It's Tim. She cracks the door and says something along the lines of how he notices everything and would guard her home since she was home alone. She said thanks, but there was no need to and to have a good day. It was beautiful weather and he looked pissed. He got angry and said, You think I can't do it because I'm dumb? But you watch and see me. I ain't dumb. She said sorry. She didn't mean it like that. But she had to rest now. She dozed off and woke up to a noise downstairs in the kitchen. The room the door from the garage led to. She hadn't heard the garage door open, but she was sick. So she just figured she was in a deep sleep and just hadn't noticed. Completely disoriented from the time she looked over at the alarm clock. It was 10.20. Way too early for her mom to be home. At that moment she heard noises again downstairs. She didn't call out. She had been sleeping in her parents' bedroom and ran into their bathroom slamming the door loudly. Then she remembered their bathroom door had no lock on it. The noise she made slamming the door alerted the intruder to where she was in the house. And big footsteps started coming upstairs. She moved quickly and quietly to her parents' closet, which was on the other side of the big room. She closed the doors and hid behind some clothes, all the time thinking how someone could have gotten inside. She remembered that the garage door was cracked for the cat, slightly, but not close enough for a thin person to slip underneath. Tim walks into the bedroom. Tim is tall and thin. She can see him through the slatted closet doors. She sees him holding a knife and did everything she could not to scream. He quickly went to the master bathroom where she was just moments before. These cookie cutter houses only have about three four plan layouts, so it wasn't hard for him to find. He looked inside the bathroom and didn't see her, then started making loud throaty noises, like someone would if they're frustrated and angry, while pacing the entire house. She stayed in the closet for hours even after she heard him exit through the front door. She stayed until her mom got home. She was crying hysterically and told her mom what happened. Had she not been so upset and had one of the kitchen knives not been left on the front door, her mom might have blamed it on being delirious from a high fever because nobody would expect Tim to do that. The police were called and an official report filed. I'm not sure if he had any charges pressed against him because after she told me the story once, she refused to talk about it again. I overheard her parents a few times talking about the situation to my own parents, but never heard what the consequences were. He was so traumatized that she went to therapy afterwards for several years, and still wouldn't talk to anyone about it because she didn't want to remember or relive the experience. We even moved into an apartment together years and years later for college purposes. She never talked about Tim, it was like he never existed, and I never asked. I noticed she always locked the front door, which you should of course. Always locked the door that led to the patio slash balcony, even though we were on the seventh level, and always locked her bedroom door, to which she added an additional lock. And when she locked all these doors and the windows, she always checked three times, every single time. 
I often wonder if there was more to the story that E told me. We were kids after all, and sometimes kids don't want to explain things that they don't understand. It is terrifying to think of what his intentions were, and if perhaps he did find E, and something else happened. As horrifying as the experience must have been for her, it made a huge statement in the neighborhood for everyone to be more careful. I will always make sure everything is locked. I don't want to ever meet you again, Tim. My name is Jaiji, and I was 14 at the time. It happened four years ago. That day, my little brother Noah was sick and had already spent three days in bed. He had a high fever. No big deal, the only real trouble was that he was six at the time. And obviously got our entire attention during that week. So yeah, that day my parents went out to buy his medicine and left me home alone to take care of him. They also asked me to bring all my brother's toys inside, so they wouldn't get wet from the rain that was coming later that day. So I did what I was asked, and I took care of Noah. I also brought some of the toys that were laying outside. I was pretty tired that day, and thought I could do the rest later. So I went inside and sat down on the couch to watch TV, before I had to prepare my brother's lunch. I was zapping through the channels and wasn't really aware of what was going on around me. About ten minutes later, I heard three honking noises coming from the side of the street, and didn't really pay attention to it. It could have been neighbors or a car passing by. Then, I realized how late it was, and then I had to go to the kitchen and start making my brother's lunch. Noah was resting upstairs, by the way. So, I was at the kitchen cooking his meal. The thing was, my kitchen has a large window, offering a view of the street. And I saw my neighbor a bit worried, out of his car looking around. Once again, I didn't pay attention to it, and was focused on the food. At a moment, I opened the fridge and had a weird feeling, like someone was there staring at me. I closed the fridge door, looked at the window, and yes, there was a person standing outside, close to the window, staring at me. Now, I don't know why, but I don't remember what the guy looked like. It was really weird. Anytime I tried to figure it out, it's like there's something blocking me. It's crazy. So, anyways... There's a stranger standing outside staring at me. I wanted to scream for help, but it just wouldn't come. I felt like the only good thing was to take my brother and leave the house from our back door. A bit excessive, I know, but I was 14, and I imagined the guy would just break the window at any moment and come in. So, on my way to Noah's room, I noticed the guy following me very calmly through the window. Imagine my surprise when I found that the front door was a bit open. I certainly didn't close it correctly when I brought my toys back in. Because of that now, I have a habit to check it at least three times, if I lock the door for sure. When I saw the door, I understood I eventually got a few seconds to go upstairs, instead of closing it, because he was so close he would just get in before I reached it. So instead, I ran upstairs, rushed into my brother's room and closed the bedroom door. Noah was very weak and kind of upset because of the noise I made downstairs. It can seem unimportant, but hearing him complain made me realize we just couldn't leave anymore. And while I was thinking, I heard someone coming upstairs, and I literally shit myself. In a desperate move, I opened the window, and fortunately just underneath it stood Noah's big ass trampoline, the one with the nets around it. The only thing reasonable for me was to throw my brother onto it and just hoping we wouldn't break our bones. Luckily, the first floor was something like four meters high. When we landed on the trampoline, I could hear the bedroom door open. Now, Noah says while getting off, he saw a face. Apparently, it was someone with a beard, wide eyebrows, and a hoodie, with a great psycho smile. I didn't, but I do believe him. We got off, and we started running down the street. While I was running, I heard a voice behind us screaming, Gigi! I turned around and was happy to see it was my neighbor, the one observing the street previously. That was waving at us to come inside his house. 
I was very confident at the idea to come inside his house, as we used to come over and play there with their kids, so we came in. He closed the door, and we waited in there for our parents to come back. While we were there with his wife and kids, he was waiting out there. Funny thing, he explained later that he saw everything, and he honked at the stalker because he was standing in the middle of the street, looking at the house. He also saw the guy walking into the house and a girl throwing her brother through the window. It was funny when he told it. So my parents came back and were ironically planning a good little evening. They even brought pizzas and a movie along with the medicine. So, imagine how stupid they looked with all of that when they saw the police car and us waiting with them. So we explained everything and we later moved into another house. We were already looking for a new place to go way before that, but that's really what gave us the motivation to search for real. We don't know what happened, but when the cops came in, the back door was open and there was no one in, which means he ran away. As I said, I still think about it sometimes, and there's no way I will ever know who the guy was. I also realized if I had done what I had asked, and had brought the trampoline back in the garage, as I was supposed to. Well, I probably wouldn't be here to tell that story. The only thing I regret is that now Noah is 10, we got rid of his old toys and that trampoline, which means we can't make that jumping thing if it happened again. So, this happened about 13 years ago. I was 10 at the time, my brother was 8. We had just moved to a new town that year, and the Walmart here has this sweet arcade up near the service desk. So, every time my parents would bring us grocery shopping, they'd give us a few dollars and let us play in the arcade. The town had an incredibly low crime rate, and the arcade is at the front of the store, where dozens of people are checking out. So, what could possibly go wrong? My brother is playing the claw machine while I'm standing on the side of the machine, trying to help him angle the claw perfectly above the stuffed animals he's trying to get. Suddenly, this random hillbilly walks up to the claw machine next to us, inserts a quarter and begins moving the claw around. But for most of this time, he's making eye contact with my brother and smiling, not even watching the game. He's not talking to us, just staring and smiling. He has long, thin brown and silver hair, pulled back in a loose ponytail at the base of his skull, a camo trucker hat, and long, scraggly beard. I remember vividly the way he smelled. Stale beer, ashtray, and something that smelled like sweat, yet sour dirt, or fungus. I tried making small talk with my brother and I, who were raised to be aware of strangers, but still be polite. Eventually we got bored of the game we were playing and I asked my brother to follow me to a new game on the opposite side of the arcade. A few seconds later the man follows us, stationing himself once again at the claw machine next to us. At some point, an overweight lady walks in and says to the hillbilly, What are you doing to these little kids? And snickers at me. He replies, I'm trying to win them some stuffed animals. She then begins playing the claw machine on the other side of us, so that my brother and I are sandwiched between these two strange hillbillies. This comment comes across as weird to me, because previously I thought that he was maybe trying to win something for his kids, but this entire time he'd just been following my brother and I from game to game, trying to win us a toy. This had been going on for maybe 20 minutes at this point. They followed us to several different machines and spent a lot of money. The games they were all playing were 25 cents per play. Each time my brother and I switched machines, they'd follow us. The hillbilly says to the lady, I'm out of money, you got any? She says, nah, I'm broke too. My brother says, I have a dollar still. Now, this is the part that really scared me. I remember listening to these two talk about some weird things with us, asking if I have a boyfriend. Asking where we go to school and where our parents work. Asking if we've ever done drugs, etc. 
But when my brother said he had a dollar, she responded with the most terrifying thing I've heard from them yet. The woman suddenly burst out. Then give it to him, boy. Her face was red. The tone in which she shouted was so ear-piercing, and the guy wrenching that I could feel blood drain from my face. My brother looked like he was about to cry. He hands her the dollar, and her face lightens up. She laughs it off, almost like she was trying to make it seem like she was joking when she yelled at us. My father walks up a couple minutes later. As I turn to tell him that these people have spent close to $15 to win a toy for us, they leave hurriedly. But before he gets a good look at them, my dad is livid. He takes us up to the front desk and tells them what I told them. They make an announcement on the intercom to keep an eye out for these people and to report to an employee if they see them. They then call the police. I don't actually remember this part or much anything after my father arrives, but this is what he told me. They never did find the couple. The police reviewed security cameras, too blurred to make out any physical details, and told my parents that the couple left the store immediately after my father showed up without any groceries. Every time I see a man or a woman in Walmart that looks as I remember them, I get anxiety and try to avoid them. So a little context to help the story flow. My parents got divorced when I was 10. I'm a female, by the way. And my brother was 8. They had bought a house in a fairly big land and decided to split it. The house was demolished and my mom was building a new house to live with me and my brother, who lived in a very small city that is known for its safety. Fast forward to when I was 15. Now I'm 25, and the house still wasn't ready. Me and my brother and my mom lived in an apartment really close to where they were building the house, so we would check it from time to time. It was an evening when me and my mom were getting back from the market and decided to go check the house. As we're parking in front of the house, the car light shows a man trying to jump the fence to get in. I was really freaked out, but my mom stepped out of the car and shouted to the man. It was an old guy, maybe in his late 60s. He was really tall, white and skinny. He was starting to go bald, having hair just on the sides of his head. He just sent me really creepy vibes. He jumped out of the fence and looked kind of scared. He wasn't expecting someone to show up because nobody lived at the place yet. He said he lived in the apartment building next to the house and he was trying to cut down a branch from a tree that was knocking on his window. So my mom said that he was trespassing and if he wanted her to do something in her house, he would have to contact her. She yelled at him to go away and never come back. We went home and never really talked about it. A few months later, my family finally moved to that house. It's a cute house with lots of trees and a space for my dog to run free. At the time, we had three dogs, two small ones and a border collie we had rescued. Every day, we could hear a teenage female voice yelling at the apartment building next to our house. We figured out it was just some teenage trauma, because we could hear her saying things every teenage said to their parents, like, I don't want to live here, or you don't get me at all. So we never really did anything about it. Some time passed and my best friend moved into an apartment in that building. She said she could hear the teen yelling at her father. Guess who the father was? Yes, the man that was trying to get inside of my yard. That freaked me out a little bit, but I didn't have any proof he was doing something to her. One evening, I was eating some fruit in the front of my house when my dog and I heard someone scream, like a man and a woman were fighting. I looked around and figured out it was coming from the building next to my house. As I looked at the building, I saw a woman falling from the balcony, but couldn't see if anyone had pushed her. So I called an ambulance and they were really fast to get here and took her to the hospital. At the same time, the police came and took the man, but I couldn't get a good look at to see if it was the same man that trespassed here. I didn't get to know what happened that day, or who the man was. My dad started building his house next to my mom's. I spent a lot of time in my best friend's apartment, 
That was just by the creepy guy's apartment. As I said, my yard was filled with trees and sometimes we could see animals there. Like lizards, snakes, foxes, possums. This day, me and my friend were in her balcony and I could see a lizard walking in the wall that separated the house and the building. In the balcony next to hers, the creepy man showed up with a gun. Trying to shoot that lizard, we started screaming for him, begging him not to kill the lizard. He looked at us surprised. I guess he thought he was alone. He said nothing, just went back in his apartment. I told my dad about it and he said I shouldn't interact with that man. I was already 18 and things started to calm down, or so I thought. It was an afternoon around 1600 and I was home alone. I decided to go for a walk with my border collie dog. She was really sweet, and I used to ride my bike as she followed me running. So I did that. As we were coming back to my house, just passing by the building, that man threw us a really big rock at my dog. She was running, so the rock hit her leg. I cursed at him and got back into my house, looking at my dog to see if she was hurt. I told my mom, and she said I should never walk alone. Some days later, I found a really cute but skinny cat at my college. I was sitting down smoking and this cat jumped into my lap. I came back to watch a class with him in my lap. He slept there for the whole class. I came back home with him. He was orange and fierce, as he was a street cat before. We let him go for walks in my street. Everyone liked him. He was really friendly and asked for everyone to pet him. People led him to their houses and frequently sent my mom pics of the cat on their yard or sofa. So we never thought that he was bothering someone by walking around. And at this time, we were forgetting about the violent nature of our neighbor. My family went on a trip to visit my grandpa and my dad stayed to take care of our pets. He said one night he heard some footsteps around his house, but as he walked out the front door, he couldn't see anyone. He thought it was just the dogs messing around, and went back into his house to sleep. When we came back, we realized that one of the trees in my mom's house was dying. It was a really big tree. We think it's about a hundred years old. This tree is the biggest one in the yard, and it was always so beautiful. I should mention that this is the tree that the man was complaining about the first time we met him. So my dad went to look at the tree and figured out that it had a lot of holes in it. He said it's a way to get poison inside of a tree to kill it. He also said we shouldn't tell my mom because it was going to scare her and make her really sad because the trees were the main reason to buy that place. I never told her about it. Some time passed and me and my brother moved to another town to finish her studies. I wanted to take my cat with me, but my mom said it was going to be hard for him to adapt living in an apartment. He liked to go for walks, so I agreed that she should stay with him. A few days later, she visited me and said my cat had died. I was broken. How did it happen? She said she thinks it was the man that killed him. We don't have any proof, but you know that feeling when you just know. I cried so much, and just running about this makes me cry. He was my first cat, and he was so sweet. My mom still lives in the same house. She has five cats now, but none of them go out. The man still lives next to her. I'm with her during quarantine, and I see him all the time. He walks past our house, always looking up to see if someone's in there.